our clock strikes here. It's always Halloween, and I'm always your haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner. Welcome to Small Frights Friday. Each week, I share a curated selection of calls from the All Hollows Hotline and letters from the Eek mailbag. This extra special spooky episode that I am recording on the very first day of fall. Ooh, is that a chill in the air? No? My thermometer reads 90 degrees. (laughs) Oh, I love a fall day in Los Angeles. Let me just turn up the air conditioning and throw on my coziest oversized sweater and pretend that it's as cold as I wish it was. This balmy episode is brought to you by Drawin. Thank you so much for supporting It's Always Halloween Drawin. And if any lanterns out there would like to sponsor a Small Frights episode, you may do so by donating $30 or more to the podcast via the tip jar, which is linked in the show notes and on our Instagram. And hey, if you do... Please tell me your favorite thing about Halloween. I would love to know a little bit more about the wonderful people who are leaving our one-time donations. This show is also made possible by the frighteningly wonderful Patreon Ghoul Gang. We hit an incredible, outstanding, eye-popping milestone this week. We picked up nine patrons, more than we've ever gotten before in one single week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am lighting an altar candle for each and every one of you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Elle. Thank you, Holly. And thank you, Peyton. And thank you to one ghoul gang member who will not be named who asked to remain anonymous. However, I do want you to know that I care about you and I am so grateful for you. So I am still putting a thank you out there for you anonymously. So an incredible new group of people showed up, which is thrilling because we just had our first marathon of the calendar Halloween season. 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 I'm so, 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 so excited. My teeth are chattering. My, my tongue is dying in knots with excitement. We watched... Uh, the first six Halloween movies, and what a ball. I have to say, I loved them even more than I usually do, except for Halloween 6, Curse of Michael Myers. I have tried with this one. Oh, how I have tried. Paul Rudd isn't enough for me. I have officially labeled the Curse of Michael Myers a dud. But that being said, you kind of still need to watch it to appreciate what's going on in the fifth one and four, five, and six make this perfect little trilogy, the trilogy of the thorn. So oh, if you've never seen it, definitely watch it. Please keep in your head, though. It is aesthetically disgusting looking, <laughs> has no soul, has no meaning, and just is poorly filmed and badly acted, except for Paul Rudd. But even Paul Rudd is doing like an odd accent in it that doesn't make a lot of sense. It feels like um, very much not prepared for how popular he's going to be, very overacting, theatrical. Um, is an interesting slash cringy experience to be a part of. If you did not get to join us this weekend, do not fret. I will be hosting another double feature next month in October on Sunday, October 10th. We are watching back-to-back Halloween H2O, Halloween 20 Years Later, with Jamie Lee Curtis, Michelle Williams, Josh Hartnett, and LL Cool J. Oh my gosh, what a freaking lineup. Then after that is going to be Halloween Resurrection with Tyra Banks and Busta Rhymes with one of the best lines in any of the Halloween movies. I will not say it here. I want you to have something to look forward to. After that, on October 14th, a Thursday, mind you, we will be watching Halloween 2018 to prepare for the new, the thrilling Halloween Kills, released everywhere on October 15th, both in the theaters and on Peacock, uh, whatever that new streaming service is from NBC. So you can watch it at home. If you are, if theaters are not accessible to you, if you don't feel comfortable going to the theaters, you have options, which is terrific. We should be giving out more options all the time to everyone, acknowledging that people have different needs, uh, different accessibilities, different uh, ways that they feel. Uh, and we should be trying to make things more tenable for everyone, for all of our different brains and bodies and lives. 
what a great thing. See it in the theater, see it at home, do what you need to do, but listen up. I'm going to do another Halloween treat because this is our season. It's always Halloween, but the calendar knows it's officially Halloween because the veil will officially be thin on October 31st. And despite our lifestyle choices, it is just this one time when the veil is thin. So to celebrate the thinning of the veil, we will be watching Halloween 2018 together as an entire Patreon ghoul gang. If you like, if you sign up at any level, you can join us for Thursday, October 14th, watching Halloween 2018. This is a bloody gory movie. I don't show a lot of really intense horror movies because the ghoul gang is a little more... uh, We all have lots of various tastes and tones, and um, I want to be able to explore the different vibes of our season because I don't think that horror and Halloween are synonymous, and I don't want to make anybody feel left out or uh, like they can't have a fun time as a community because everything we're watching is too gross. But I do love these movies. So we will be watching gross movies next month. I am playing with an idea right now that um, maybe in November we'll kick off watching some uh, requested movies or movies that have been recommended to us. And maybe we'll do like a little run of recommended movies after Halloween. Uh, Things that are a little cozier, things that are a little more of like a wind down, but still kind of Halloween themed because you know that Halloween hangover is rough and it's coming. And I just think if we acknowledge it now, we can prep a little bit for it. It won't hurt as much on November 1st. Okay. So what was it that I was just screaming about? October 10th, Halloween H2O, Halloween Resurrection, back to back for everyone who signs up for the movie tiers on Patreon. And then October 14th, Halloween 2018, I'm opening as a treat up to every single patron. Sign up at any level and you can enjoy a movie night with us. This is not something I do a lot. I opened up a day last month. I don't know when I'll do it again. This is an extra special thank you to everyone who has been so supportive during our very first year of this podcast. I seriously would have run out of money. I was running out of money Um, when I started the Patreon. I put my whole stimulus check into getting this (laughs) this show up and going. I am being so truthful with you right now. I'm a, I'm a, a working class person from a working class background and I work two jobs and I, uh, really have put my all into this job, uh, into this new job, what I hope will be a new job working on this podcast, which brings me so much joy. This community sprung up in a way I was not expecting, continuously bringing tears to my eyes, making me feel less lonely, more seen, have more joy in my heart. Um, It's very thrilling. All of this to say, I thank you so much for jumping on the Patreon, for sharing uh, posts, for telling your friends, for uh, just interacting on our social medias, everything that you've done, all of you, not just people doing the, the Patreon, but everybody, everything you've done to support the podcast over the last year has been incredible and so meaningful and has helped me keep this podcast going because yes, I would have, I ran out of stimulus money as we all did because we didn't get enough. And now um, I'm a hundred percent fueled. This whole podcast is fueled by Patreon. So little thank you uh, for a movie night next month. And then if there are any lanterns in the Southern California area, we are going to be doing a uh, Southern California lantern meetup the first weekend of October, that's in a week. We're still hammering out the details. We're thinking the second or the third. But uh, send an email if you're interested, and I will loop you in. We're primarily planning this on the Patreon Discord right now. For $3 and up on Patreon, you can join our Discord. But that it is going to be open to anyone who wants to join. So, uh, yeah, I will announce, I guess, our final plan next Friday on October 1st. But if you want to know before then, or you want to make sure you don't miss out, send me an email at it's always Halloween podcast an email. I mean, an eek mail. What's wrong with me? Send me an eek mail to it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com and say, I want to come to the Southern California lantern meetup and we'll give you the details.
Last but not least, we do have a new scary ghost story coming out on the Patreon next week. Another story from Tiny Nightmares, a book that I have read all month long and is disturbing. Some stories more upsetting than others. Some stories jarring, others kind of just like, ugh. Like, I feel bad now. I didn't like that at all, <laughs> which is sometimes what happens with, you know, a little a book of scary stories. Sometimes it's chilling in a fun way, and other times you're like, oh, my humanity has been challenged. Uh, and then there's a couple that are, like, really artistic that, like, I love. The intellectual part of me is like, oh, yes, mm, what does it mean? Let's ponder on these metaphors. And then other times I'm like, oh, God, I worked all day on, on my feet, and I just, I just don't want to unravel what this person is trying to say. So I'm enjoying the book quite a bit. A lot of different styles, a lot of different voices, uh, very inclusive, definitely still recommending it. Uh, if, if, if you're not trying to get any more books right now, though, and you want to hear this beautiful voice read you something spine-chilling and utterly depraved, then you should sign up for the Patreon at the ghost story level, and you will get a new story next week. And two stories every month from here on out. All right, guys, let's get into our calls and eek mails. First up, a wonderfully exciting call from Missouri. Hey, Luce, this is Michelle. Um, I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. Otherwise, I might have to call back. Um, I just started listening to your podcast a couple of weeks ago, and I'm almost completely caught up. I absolutely love it, and I've been telling all of my clients about it, all of my friends about it, sharing it on my Instagram, and I hope you get more lanterns listening. Um, but I just wanted to share a little story about my neighborhood, and I might call back, like I said, because I feel like I have so many things to tell you. Um, we just moved into a historic neighborhood where our house is from 1905, um, and knowing me loving all things spooky, I like hoped that it was haunted. <laughs> um, but also I just wanted to kind of talk about our neighborhood. Um, it's in Springfield, Missouri, and it's called Brown Tree. And they're super into Halloween here. And that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to live, um, in this area of town. So much so that they actually have to close down the streets for Halloween, and we have anywhere between 4,000 and 7,000 trick-or-treaters. It's insane. Um, and every house goes all out. Um, like I said, there's just, it's, it's crazy. Everybody has fire pits out on their front porch. All of the houses around here are from the 18 and 1900s, so you have front porches that are all done up, and it's just so much fun. And we just got into this house this year, and I cried when we found out because I was just so excited to have Halloween in Roundtree. So I'll be taking pictures and sending them to you. Um, but I just wanted to let you know the good news and wanted you to look into that. So talk to you later. Bye. Michelle, oh my goodness. Your neighborhood sounds like a dream come true. I have never heard of Roundtree, but I have driven through Springfield, Missouri as a teen with my parents because they have friends in St. Louis. And Springfield, I mean, how fun. Of course, it's one of the many possible Springfields mentioned on The Simpsons. But anywho, so getting back to your point these pictures, I looked it up, I googled, I wanted to learn all about this wonderful place that loves Halloween more than anywhere else in Missouri. And boy, if you Google Roundtree Halloween, Missouri, lots of incredible pictures come up. I am looking at one now that looks like it is a still ripped from one of the Halloween movies. A gorgeous blanket of leaves coats the ground. You can't even tell the grass from the sidewalk. Everything is leaves, yellow and tan and caramel and just brown. 
with reds and oranges peeking through as trick-or-treaters are stomping through excitedly with their different little baskets and buckets and pillowcases. People seem to be holding umbrellas, but that doesn't seem to be dampening the experience as someone who is talking to you from a desert right now. I know Halloween in the rain is not the best, but there is something about it. Um, Having to incorporate some type of all-weather proofing to your costume really does uh, get the creative juices going. It's very funny to see pictures of skeletons holding umbrellas. Oh no, my bones are so wet and slick. Um, I see... I see an Ursula with a cowboy, with a skeleton, with a old-timey prisoner? I don't know, they're in a striped pajama-like ensemble. (laughs) These are just so wonderful. The streets are packed. An unbelievable amount of people and kids (laughs) incorporating their parkas into their outfits. I think I see a pirate here. I see a uh, toucan, a power ranger, a witch. This is just delightful. A very disturbing Pennywise, uh, a, a shark, a Yeti, um, Chewy. Oh my gosh. Absolutely fantastic. Each kid and adult decked out to the nines, makeup, masks, costumes bags, as I said, matching umbrellas. Everyone's got their galoshes in the mix. This is so absolutely fantastic. And this, again, the streets are packed. And it looks like uh, you guys also have an incredible and very locally famous Halloween parade as well. If you are Googling Springfield, it comes up as the must trick or treat place in the city. It's like, number one, you have to trick-or-treat in a round tree. So congratulations. I can see why you're so psyched. And just hearing how thrilled you were, I started to tear up a little bit. I cannot imagine what it would be like to own property (laughs) or even get to participate in this level of Halloween. It's truly a dream of mine. And I'm just so excited for you. Of course, I am on the edge of my seat for pictures without wanting to rush this season because we just got here. (laughs) But I wish you all the fun in the world as you decorate your new house and get to explore all the nooks and crannies. My apartment building was also built in 1905. I did ask if it was haunted before we moved in. They told me no. And I'm taking them at their word because as you know, I am not trying to tempt ghosts. If I have to sit alone in a closet several days a week, I don't want any spirit messing with me. I just, I can't handle it. I'm already in a closet. Things are rough enough. So Michelle, please keep us posted on the decorating, on the costumes, if your house is indeed haunted. And again, so happy for you. What a thrilling life achievement. I wish you all the best. Many spooky returns. Oh, hold on. I'm getting another call. Just a second. This doesn't usually happen. Let's take this call that's coming in right now. Hey, Luce, it's Michelle again. I got off quickly because my husband was coming outside and I felt embarrassed <laughs> because I was calling in to the Halloween podcast. He already thinks I'm weird because I started celebrating in July. So anyway, I'm calling back. I was the one that was talking about my um, new neighborhood that we moved into. Um, I was going to let you know I'm going to send you some pictures. I had a couple of friends that live in the neighborhood that had pictures from a few years ago um, that were just really cool. I mean, people dressed as huge praying mantises on stilts, and there's a big house that was decorated as a pirate ship, and then the other one was decorated like an underwater scape, and they were dressed as mermaids. It's literally like something out of a movie. Um, that you would see. And even last year during the pandemic, uh, they canceled the, there's usually a Halloween parade where all the kids and people in the neighborhood dress up and walk down the road. Um, And like I said, there's usually about 7,000 kids. And last year it was canceled due to COVID. 
And there were still about, from what I've heard from other people in the neighborhood, about 4,000 trick-or-treaters still. Um, on a normal year, there's about seven. So one of the guys said what they did was they created a catapult and they took the candy and they catapulted it out into the street for all the kids to scramble around and get their candy safely <laughs> at a distance. So I just thought that was so cute and fun, which, you know, there are other people that had little luges. They would put them down and things like that. But I just thought the catapult idea was just so cute. And he said at some point in time, there's about 200 trick-or-treaters lined up just to get some candy from the catapult. So... I will keep you posted on the pictures this year. I was lucky enough to have our neighbor across from us is super into Halloween. Um, So I'm really excited to have her um, over and just our whole neighborhood. I'm just so excited. So I'll keep you posted and I'll also keep you posted on if I see any ghosts in our house. Um, I was hoping being built in 1905 that someone would still be in here. So... All right. Love the podcast. Love you. Love the whole Lantern group. And keep up the good work. My goodness, what a treat we get to hear from Michelle twice. And you're really turning up the heat on this trick-or-treating experience. Are you inviting all of us to your house this year? Because you are making it sound pretty sweet. Like there's nowhere else in America that would be quite as fun as Roundtree on Halloween, a praying mantis on stilts, a catapult, mermaids, a pirate ship. This city has everything. I am fully about to become Stefan right now, but that's not on purpose. I'm just so excited and I want to be there. You have painted a picture and I am ready to show up and buy that picture from you. All right. uh, Let me know your address so I can come over on Halloween. You can just, I won't give it to everybody. Just email it to me and I will show up on your doorstep on October 31st. And we will catapult candy to all of these smiling faces. And real quick, just like a quick word with your husband. Husband, oh look, you maybe don't realize this, but this is a very popular and beloved Halloween podcast. We're a bit of a tastemaker here. We are on the NPR One app. That's NPR, the National Public Radio. So is Michelle a little weird? Of course she is because she loves the weirdest holiday of them all Halloween the time when the veil is the thinnest and the spirits are coming out to devour our souls so yeah we're a little weird but that is what makes us great and you know what I know you're not judging Michelle because you love her you married her you know what a fantastically weird macabre bizarre little creature she is and that makes you love her all the more remember that tell her that so that she doesn't feel self-conscious about calling this very cool Halloween podcast again. Michelle, you're wonderful. We're so happy to have you. Thank you for calling in and uh, thank your husband for listening to my little lecture and I hope that we get to hear from him soon. I bet he's going to be a new fan after this. All right, looking forward to hearing all about Halloween in Roundtree. (laughs) Send me that address, girl, and I will show up. Up next, we have an eek mail, the subject of which is decorations. In this age of 12 foot tall skeletons, I wanted to bring you and your listeners with me into the past to remember decorating in my childhood, the early 90s. October 1st was a magical day. Every year, the crisp fall air, the colors falling from the trees, the smell of cider filling the house. And on that day, I knew it was time to get out the box. It was a simple cardboard box with the word Halloween written on it. The box must have been compiled over the generations. Some of the decorations were from the childhood of my own parents, wrapped delicately in newspaper for protection. We had a town of tiny spooky houses that we could plug in. We had ceramic ghosts and pumpkins and skulls, which would have lights placed inside of them. We had the myriad of McDonald's pails and tea lights. These lights would change the feel of the whole month. 
No longer the normal white bulbs of summer, nor the rainbow of indoor winter lights. This was that liminal time between the warm orange glow of autumn nights, building 31 days of anticipation for the main event. The window decals were always magical to me as a kid. No tape, no hooks. The thin plastic images of ghosts, bats, witches, cats, owls, and pumpkins would just all stick directly to the cold inside of the window for the whole month. And for opaque surfaces of walls and doors, we had posable figures, a witch, a vampire, a skeleton, and a scarecrow. We pinned those to the walls with a tack, and I could change their position anytime I wanted. We had a string of paper jack-o'-lanterns that would go along the living room wall and cut out bats with double-sided tape on the back all over the walls of our house. We had a plastic spider web with suction cups for the glass on the door. Hanging outside was a plastic motion-censored ghost that would ooh when somebody walked past, and I absolutely loved hearing the sound of it. Outside, we would also stuff old clothes with straw to make a scarecrow and wrapped a sheet around a soccer ball to make a ghost swinging from our trees. All month, we would rake leaves and fill the big orange bag that had the jack-o'-lantern face on it. And by the 31st, these would be joined by freshly carved pumpkins. Everything had to go back in the box on November 1st, but I don't even want to think about that now. It's too sad. I'd love to hear about what some of your favorite decorations were. Lanterns and Luce? Happy Halloween, Becky. Oh, Becky, what a gorgeous eek mail. You really painted such an incredible picture of what Halloween felt like in childhood. I adored those uh, orange those orange garbage bags that looked like a big jack-o'-lantern once they were all filled up those were just scattered across my neighborhood and they would go out at different times you know there'd be one or two at first and then suddenly like you said by the end of the month everybody's yards had them my parents did not get them uh, because they just didn't think it was worth the cost of the extra specialized garbage bags but We did have some other really cool decorations. Um, When I was a really young kid, the first decorations we got that I absolutely loved were the skeletons that had the paper accordion legs and arms, and we would hang those on our porch. And then as I got older, we would like slowly build our decorations for outside. We got these really neat plastic bendable skeletons that were about a foot and a half tall and we used those on our bushes outside that lined our walk and this was a a decoration that we got when I was pretty young and then it just became like a classic uh, decor thing that we would do so we'd have these small bushes that lined the front walk going up to our porch And each bush got one of these bendable skeletons, and I loved to do a different pose, an intricate pose with each skeleton, and then I'd wire it into the bush. So it's like some look like they were jumping, other ones were like lounging in like a paint me like one of your French girls pose. Uh, Other ones would be all twisted up. Some would be doing like a, a lookout pose, and I just thought it was the most fun thing to create these different poses. And I always liked injecting a little bit of humor where I could with some of our decorations. Uh, We also, my mom and I would go to Goodwill and we'd find like old plaster busts, you know, like not not like fancy castle (laughs) type ones, but you know, like the fake ones that you might find at like TJ Maxx or something. Uh, And we'd see them a lot at Goodwill. So we would get those and then my mom would spray paint them gray and then we'd put a little black on them and We would add some Spanish moss, and then we would create this graveyard in our garden. So one one side of our sidewalk was our our bushes, and then the other side was this garden that my mom tended. And so we turned the garden side into this graveyard, and my dad made these cool cardboard gravestones, and everybody was really creative. I'm an only child, so it was just 
me and my parents, and it was always very much coming from a DIY perspective. Like every now and then we did get something special from the store. We have uh, one of the ghouls with the light up eyes that shakes and moans kind of like your ghost, Becky. Um, That was really exciting the day that we got that because it felt like kind of a fancy decoration and we made a lot of stuff. So to get one of those, it just felt like extra special. And we had a candelabra that was a skull and then had like three candles that were like, you know, had little glass lights that you would um, screw in and then it would flicker. And I loved that. And a few years ago, my mom sent me both the candelabra and the ghoul in their original boxes that are really neat. And I really like getting those out every year. Even if I can't fully decorate every year, I definitely try to bring those out because it's such like a really warm, positive memory from growing up. And it's just, it's nice. I love that you had things that belong to your parents. I think it's so special to pass decorations down. And that really goes for every holiday because, you know, as we've talked about in the past, traditions are what connects us to the generation before. And uh, some of them are good and some of them are not good, but uh, discussing them helps us learn a little bit more about who we are and where we're from and how we got here. And that can even be something small, like a little porcelain Halloween village that tells a story. And I think it's uh, meaningful and really lovely to keep those. And it's definitely one of, um, you know, those things I look forward to, even if it like, you know, originally came from like drug mart or whatever, (laughs) these plastic, this plastic candelabra. I I hope I can pass it down to someone at some point because, um, I hope it I hope it brings another generation as much joy as it's brought me my whole life. I sound like I am on my deathbed. <laughs> I am in my 30s. I have lots of time with this candelabra. I'm not looking to part with it. <laughs> my mom just sent it to me a couple years ago. <laughs> what is it about Halloween? I guess it's that veil. I can't stop talking about it on this episode. Just the reminder of um, life and death and how close we are to the other side this time of year. It gets me feeling so contemplative and makes me think about, uh, you know, everybody in my life that I love who's no longer with us and the, the gifts that we shared, the things that we shared around Halloween together. It's just such a... Um, a time to look back. And every time I look back, I see lots of ghosts and some of them are very comforting. Some are very scary and uh, some are just there (laughs) staring back. (sighs) Becky, this is such a lovely eek mail. Thank you. I really look forward to hearing from other lanterns about their favorite decorations. (laughs) Honestly, I have to stop myself because deck, decor is like my favorite thing. Um, and I love it. I love it. I, I imagine someday I'll have a little more time in my life and I'll get to fully decorate my apartment the way I always dream of it. But, um, until then I have lots of wonderful memories and I have your beautiful stories and the inside of my mind is quite decorated and that's good for now. Thank you so much, Becky. We look forward to hearing from you again soon. Up next, we have a call from Ashley about a super lucky day. Hi, my name is Ashley, and I wanted to say I love your podcast, and I'm not sure how I didn't find it sooner, but I'm happy that I found it. Um, I wanted to share a bit about my wedding journey, which became spooky without me even trying. Um, some backstory, me and my fiancé met in college, and we quickly bonded over our love for Halloween. Everyone that knows us knows, you know, we love Halloween, we decorate early, we make our own costumes. Um, and so we got engaged last February and started looking for venues. And we found one that we loved so much, but it was booked uh, almost every Friday and Saturday from May to August. Uh, So we were kind of bummed out, but the wedding coordinator emailed us and she was like, actually, we do have an opening. It's Friday, May 13th. And so Friday the 13th. And I'm sure a lot of couples didn't want that date due to superstition and that's why it was available. But being the Halloween lovers that we are, we took it and we were so excited. Um, and the day turned out to be even more special because when I listened to the first episode of the podcast, which was yesterday, I heard that the history began May 13th. 
Uh, so I texted my fiance and we were super excited about it. And so I can only assume that this date was made for a spooky couple like us. Anyways, thank you for the podcast. And I love it. And I'm sure I will be caught up soon. All right. Take care. Wow, Ashley, congratulations. That sounds so exciting. I would love to be married on uh, Friday the 13th. I'm not engaged, but just the idea of having a special day on a day that already is flocked with so much luck, in my opinion, um, and so much history and fascination. It just would be such a great icebreaker. Anytime anybody asks you about your wedding day, you can be like, oh, well, Friday the 13th. Uh, I'm curious. I feel like I did not totally understand from your call. Did you get married this past May or are you getting married next May? Either way, very excited for you. Uh, If you already are married, would love to see pictures. If you're getting married next May, please keep us posted. I would love to know if you're going to be incorporating any imagery from Friday the 13th, either the movie or, you know, cats ladders, broken mirrors, a broken mirror at a wedding seems a little sharp and dangerous. So maybe pass on that one, but like, like imagery wise, you know, like, will there be guests at the black cat table? Will there be guests at the ladder table, the broken mirror table, the, what are other superstitions? My mind is going blank. Um, anywho, so I'd love to hear about it keep us posted. I'm so happy that you found the podcast and I uh, look forward to hearing more about this incredible wedding of yours. Up next, we have an eek mail with the subject line candy trading. Hi, Luce. I just finished your archive and there's one essential part of Halloween I don't recall hearing about candy trading. I have so many fond memories of Halloween, the costumes, the decorations, the pumpkin carving, that feeling of joy watching a neighbor slide a full-sized candy bar into your pillowcase. But one one part of my useful Halloween I'll never forget is the candy trading. My siblings and I would get home at the end of the night, take off our masks with the rest of our costumes still on, and pour our individual piles onto the living room rug. Then came all the sorting, sifting the pile into little groups so we knew what we had and could see what we wanted. Then came the negotiations. Everything had a different value to every kid. For me, anything that combined chocolate and peanut butter was of high value. Agreed. My older sister was really into gum and jawbreakers and suckers, but she ended up being the sucker. (laughs) Those were worthless to me, but I drove a hard bargain and got as many peanut butter cups and candy bars from her as I could stash, (laughs) or excuse me, as I could for my stash of her favorites. My younger brother loved chocolate and I had him convinced that it was all about volume, so he thought he was getting a steal by taking the bigger pile as I stole his delicious (laughs) Reese's and Snickers in exchange for boring old Hershey's and Tootsie Rolls. (laughs) I remember none of us valued black licorice at that age, and we couldn't give it away. Candy trading with friends and siblings is such an underappreciated part of Halloween. Did you have anyone to trade with, Luce? I'd love to hear from other lanterns about some memorable trades from their childhood. Thank you so much for this podcast that brings Halloween into our hearts every week year-round. You're the best. Love, Nate. Aw, Nate. You're so welcome. This is an underrated and essential part of Halloween. Wow, what a great call. Candy trading was everything. I was reading this and I just had a smile plastered on my face this entire time because you just, your descriptions were spot on. And Nate, you and I could have never traded because we were on the exact same page. I, it was all Reese's and Snickers were at the top of mine also. Although I do love, not love, that's a strong word. I do really enjoy Tootsie Rolls, but yes, I would have traded them for Reese's anything. Um, I also really liked Butterfingers. I guess that's kind of in the peanut butter realm and Twix. I would put up with a Milky Way. I really wasn't feeling Three Musketeers, and I wanted nothing to do with dots 
Whoppers, anything that you could shake in a little box. I enjoyed the tininess of the box, the way that it looked like a mini version of its the larger like movie theater sizes. There's something about the, how tiny the box was. It was very cute to me, more so than just the little fun-sized chocolate bars. The box was everything. But what was inside the box, total trash. Didn't want it. Um, so because I'm an only child, I did not have siblings, but... Uh, always baked into the trick-or-treating experience was I would go over to one of my friends' house afterwards. Each year it would be a different friend. Maybe people would come over to my house. Uh, Maybe we'd go over to one of the Katie's. I had multiple friends named Katie as a child and we all hung out together. Uh, We all lived exactly one block away from each other. Different Katie on each block. Um, And so we would do those trades. And you're right, I absolutely loved sorting my candy. Like even after we did all the trades and I was home by myself, I loved dumping my candy out again and just sorting it into different groups and seeing it all lined up. It just felt so like, what an accomplishment, you know? Uh, I had this problem and I still actually struggle with this as an adult and I'm really working on it. I'm like coaching myself on it where I would be like, okay, I've got eight Reese's cups and I'd, I'd start in on the Reese's cups and then I would start to save them because I was like, oh, when these are gone, then I don't have any more Reese's cups. And so I'd eat more of the trash candy and I would save some of my best candy and save it and save it and save it until it'd be like the end of November and it would start to be gross. And every now and then I saved my candy for too long and my mom had to throw it out. Isn't that so sad? Because I didn't want it to be gone so I didn't use it at all. It's sort of a collector mentality, which I'm very much a collector. Um, uh, But I do not put any of my collections, like I don't have those glass Ikea shelves and I don't keep toys in, in like plastic boxes or anything. I'm very much into using things. And for some reason I have, I have trouble doing that with like special treats where I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to use this. Like, like one of my friends gave me soap shaped like a coffin. And I was like, I don't want to use this. It's beautiful. So it was just sitting on my bathroom shelf for like two years. And then finally I opened it up this year and I was like, things are for using. (laughs) And I'm trying to, I love um, the ephemeralness of experiences and interactions one-on-one with people in person. And I'm trying to apply that appreciation for the ephemeral to single use items and be like, it's okay if this coffin soap is gone, it was meant to be used and treasured and enjoyed. And when it's gone, it's gone and something new will come into my life again. And uh, it's it's so hard. <laughs> I don't know why I struggle with that. I have definitely just like let things, let treats go stale because I didn't want to eat it and then not have it anymore. And I enjoyed just the experience of having it. So I'm very curious if any other, um, any other people out there have their internal child that's just like, oh, I don't want my trick or treat pillowcase to be empty. I must save my candy. (laughs) Maybe it's an only child thing too. I'd be curious to know if there's any other only children with this experience because I definitely have heard from Isaac and other friends that have siblings that like, if you didn't eat your candy, it would be gone. (laughs) So you had to like enjoy your candy kind of quickly because if you saved it for too long, someone else was going to eat it. So maybe that's a little bit of a luxury I had as somebody who didn't have to share a room and didn't have to share a candy. I could just like stare at it every single day and lay it all out and look at it and never eat it. I'm so happy that you enjoy the podcast, Nate. I very much enjoyed your eek mail, and I look forward to hearing from you again soon. Hi, Luce. Uh, This is Rosa at Pumpkin Queen on Instagram, and I just want to say I am so obsessed with your podcast. I'm obsessed with you. Uh, I did meet you when I was vending at Awaken the Spirits, and you did tell me about um, It's Always Halloween, and I literally binged every, the whole episode, every single episode for two and a half weeks, and I am obsessed. Even my little son knows when he sees a logo, it's always Halloween. He recognizes it because I was always listening to it. Um, but I just want to say that I absolutely do love everything that you do. Um, I am always, uh, 
sorry, my son was uh, messing with the phone. But I just want to say that I am obsessed with everything that you do. I love that you put so much hard work and effort with everything that you do, researching um, with it being history, uh, traditions. I'm always learning something new uh, within Halloween. Um, I am so excited. Next, uh, I am actually a Scorpio uh, like yourself. And I'm almost a Halloween baby, October uh, 24th, and I'm just excited about this Halloween. Hopefully, we're able to trick-or-treat. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say I love you. I love this podcast and keep doing all this amazing work. Um, and, yeah, and it's always Halloween. Thank you so much for all that love, Rosa. And I absolutely adore you too. Rosa was the very first person I met when I walked into Awaken the Spirits last month in August. And, you know, going to an event like that after being in lockdown for a year and a half, I didn't know if I was going to have any of my social graces about me anymore, but I was excited to talk about It's Always Halloween and meet other passionate Halloween artists. And uh, Rosa and her brother, I believe his name is Tony, greeted me with such joy and we had this incredible discussion about all of the haunted houses that they either grew up in or that their family have lived in and it was like 11 a.m. and the sun was streaming in the windows but I had such a chill crawling up my spine as they were telling me these super freaky stories and it was truly the best experience to kick off my weekend and the way that they created such a Halloween vibe, not just with their incredible art, with, excuse me, with Rose's incredible art, but also just (laughs) with all of their stories and their excitement. And that's what I really love. You know, I've talked about this so much on the podcast and on the Instagram. It's just so important to support uh, each other and real artists and real people because people like Rosa love Halloween, like truly love Halloween. I don't think the CEO of TJ Maxx loves Halloween. He loves money. And I do love just walking into ordinary stores and seeing Halloween. And I don't want to take that away from anybody. It's exciting to see a regular store just all of a sudden be ducked out in Halloween items. But when it comes to spending your hard earned money, definitely check out Pumpkin Queen. She makes everything by hand and you can see her passion in each item. Uh, She gifted me a really, really fun, super cute pair of jack-o'-lantern earrings that I have been wearing nonstop because they're super light. And every time I wear them, I get so many compliments on them because they're really big and I love big obnoxious jewelry. Uh, because I love to steal the scene anytime I walk in the door. (laughs) Um, But check out Rose's work. It's at Pumpkin Queen on Instagram. She has an Etsy as well. And she just made these really cool shadow boxes with these neat little jack-o'-lantern guys inside of them and shared with me um, in a message that she was listening to the podcast while she was making them. So get yourself one of her shadow boxes and you will have a little piece of It's Always Halloween infused art for your wall. And please, Rosa, next time you call in or write us an email, I'd love to be able to repeat one of those great stories that uh, I heard from you at the event. And love and hello to your sweet little son. I hope he enjoys the podcast as well. And I'm excited to hear about how Trick or Treat goes and what costume he's going to wear this year. All right. Take care. So wonderful to hear from you. If you have a Halloween memory you want to share, a Halloween artist you want to shout out, you have questions about something you want to learn connected to Halloween, you just want to share some decorating stories, hey, I want to hear them. Your fellow lanterns want to hear those stories. You can give us a call on the All Hallows Hotline, 802-532-DEAD. Or you can drop us an email at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. 
I have received some great eek mails lately, uh, volunteers for uh, helping with intern duties. I need some help researching. I need some help organizing. I need some social media help. And I am going to get back to everyone who has messaged me very soon. If any of that sounds like fun to you, I'm definitely accepting um, more, more applications. Application is really just tell me a little bit about yourself and what your background is. I just need to see that you're like a real person who's uh, chill and positive and, uh, you know, understands the mission of the podcast to create community and uh, spread Halloween joy. Uh, doesn't need to be a super formal thing, but I do want to know that you're not like a secret mega person. Uh, so I have gotten those emails. I will get back to you. I am definitely accepting more. This is a very DIY project. Uh, I'm the only one who goes through the email box. So definitely takes a little time to get on top of everything. And I thank everybody for your patience, especially at this very special time of year. So like I said, at the top of the podcast, if you love It's Always Halloween, please subscribe at patreon.com slash it's always Halloween, or you can make a one-time donation using our tip jar. Any amount in the tip jar goes directly to helping us make this podcast. A donation of $30 or more gets you a shout out as a sponsor at the top of a Small Frights episode. You can also support the podcast by buying It's Always Halloween merch on Redbubble. That link is in our show notes and our Instagram as well. This episode of It's Always Halloween was performed by me, Luce Tomlin Brenner, with help from your fellow lanterns, including Michelle, Ashley, Rosa, Nate, and Becky. Thank you so much for your contributions and making this episode extra special. The editing, theme music, and sound design is by the absolutely fabulous Pete Burns. Thanks so much, Pete. You can follow me at LTB Comedy on Instagram and Twitter, and you can follow Pete at Mittenberries on Instagram and Twitter. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe and write us a little review so that other like-minded ghouls can find us. It's a free, easy way to help the podcast and ensure that we can build our lantern army. Just kidding. But it would be nice to make more friends. I want to read a review that we just got this week. Uh, it, the subject line is, what a gem. And it's by AJR017. I'm so glad I found this podcast. I'm not sure what it is, but everything about the show just feels cozy. It makes you feel like it's Halloween no matter what time of year it is. It's not trying to be scary. It's just informative and fun. And it's not another true crime murder show posing as a spooky podcast. <laughs> the production value, background music, and sound effects add so much ambiance to the already stellar and well-researched content. Thank you so much for putting so much time and effort into this show. Keep up the excellent work. Well, I thank you so much. As much as I can enjoy occasional true crime episodes, it is a lot. <laughs> So we will try to stay away from murder as much as possible on this show, except for how it may pertain to Halloween history. If you're not on Apple, hey, you know what? We're also on the NPR One app. So subscribe to us there and please tell Ira Glass you love us. Thanks for listening to It's Always Halloween. And please a come back next time unless you get stuck in a bidding war for Reese's Cups. And if you win them, can you bring some for me? I don't want to eat them. I just want to look at them and save them forever.